All right, Tim, Chief Financial Officer's report. Yeah, the, the operating revenue for the month of February was uh, three point, about $3.5 million. The total revenue was a little bit over $4.2 million. The March uh, due date for property taxes, we begin to start receiving money in, in, in February, so we, that's the most significant part of the revenue for the month. In, 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 in March, we're going to see an even larger uh, receipt on property taxes. Um, we did have tax refunds during the month of $114,000. That's what we have for the whole year so far. Uh, we have budgeted 424,000, so we're only at 27% on the tax refunds, which is good. Um, and the operating revenue for the first eight months, 13,840,000, 63% of budget. Uh, on, the, on the financial report, the majority of the, of the funds are, are pretty close to that, that 60 to 65% range. They're gonna jump up quite a bit, as I say, in March. The one operating fund that's lagging behind is transportation because of the reimbursements that we're receiving from the state. We've received one reimbursement from the state so far out of three. So we've picked up, we've, we've received $74,000 out of a budget of $225,000. So that holds down the transportation fund. We're seeing the same kind of reimbursements on special education uh, in the education fund. It's just within the education fund, there's so much other revenue that that it, it doesn't really have an impact on the overall revenue in that fund, but it does in the transportation fund. Um, operating expenditures for the month, $1.6 million. Total expenditures, $1.9 million. Uh, the, the difference between them was $270,000 in purchase services uh, on the capital projects fund. Our operating fund balance, $17,170,000. There was a question regarding the um, the receipt of <coughs> property taxes in the IMRF fund. Uh, for IMRF, we didn't, we don't have any money budgeted there, but some of the money we received in March was put into that. You'll remember over the past few years, we didn't budget anything and didn't put anything into IMRF because of the audit that we had. It didn't impact the total amount of money going into the IMRF fund, but it was all budgeted for Social Security as opposed to for IMRF. In the levy that we did last December, we changed that, okay, but the budget wasn't adjusted for that. So it's, it's not going to impact, as I said, the overall revenue in that fund. We're just going to see a split between IMRF and Social Security on that. So we did make a levy. Pardon? We did levy for <coughs> We did levy for IMRF. We forgot to put it in the budget. Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. Uh, the only other things I wanted to cover, the... Uh, the uh, Health insurance renewal, uh, we're part of the Educational Benefit Cooperative. Our insurance increases uh, for the PPO and the HMO plan are going to be 4.7% next year. Insurance premiums are trending at about 6.5%. We had actually uh, put into our long-range plan 7%. Um, being part of the pool really helps us to hold down the increases, <coughs> kind of flatten things out a little bit. One of the other things that the pool does is the PPO plan would have resulted in a 7.2% increase, but they used part of the working cash to, to, to reduce the amount of the increase, um, which helps all the districts. So we're, being in a pool with 92 school districts <coughs> really helps us to, to, to keep the increases low. And it also provides a lot of information to us on the Affordable Care Act. There's changes every year with regard to that, and it helps us stay on top of that. So, Tim, I got one question on it. So we're at 4.7% for next year. We're at 4.7, right. The average for both PPO and HMO were 5.7, but our experience dropped us down into the category below that, so we're at 4.7. And then you said the trend in health insurance premiums increases to 6.5%. Is that like school That's insurance? That's just a national trend on health insurance okay. increases. And we're below 2.3% uh, from what PMA projected, right? Correct. Okay. Um, with regard to IMET, uh, there was a report in the Chicago Tribune back on March 11th that IMET had written off 2.8% of every account. The question was how much of that is, would impact um, RB. We would lose about $5,000 on that. That would be the total amount. Um, the article also talked about how IMET expects the majority of the assets they've seized to be sold in May. <clears throat> 
with a, a, a distribution in June, uh, they expect to recover about 60% of the total loss. Uh, after that, there are insurance policies that IMET and Pennant have uh, that, that hopefully would allow us to recover um, most, if not all, of the money that, that um, was part of the fraud. Including the 5000 right off? Yes. Uh, there was a question about the, the insurance that the Township Treasurer's Office had. They have a Treasurer's Bond, which is $25 million. They have an errors and omission policy, which is a million dollars. They do not have a public entity management liability policy. Um, we is, it, is that normal or unnormal for a township? For them to not carry that? Yeah. I think that's probably normal that most government agencies would carry that. Uh, we've discussed this with Brian Crowley at Fransic Radlick. Uh, I included a, a memo that he sent us uh, with regard to the situation. Uh, Dr. Skinkas and I talked to him. His recommendation was that we wait over the next few months to see what develops um, after the, the sale of these assets, depending upon how much of the money we get back, um, then decide on a course of action after that. Could I also follow up with a recommendation that you reach out to the township treasurer and ask them who their investment companies that they're using and what kind of insurance policies that they have and the coverages they have, and then rush, you know, flush it through with the the law firms to see that if there's another situation like this that there's some insurance that could cover you know, this kind. Of yes. Also, another thing, too, is when George Shrempus puts out a press release that makes it look very positive, when other sources are in Illinois, he needs to be able to account for that. Okay. Okay. And the final thing is financial advisor. We've discussed this before. Um, the the Dodd-Frank Act created a separation between underwriters and financial advisors going back a couple of years ago. Um, I highlighted some of the things that a financial advisor does <coughs> If you hire one, um, one of the biggest things they do is they go out if you're going to issue bonds and they um, do a competitive sale with underwriters uh, to provide you with the best the best prices. Um, I was asked to get three different quotes, which I did from William Blair, PMA, and Spear Financial. Uh, William Blair was by far the, the least expensive of the three. Um, what I'd like to do is bring back to the board next month a recommendation to approve Blair as our financial advisor and then possibly bring them in at the April cow to, to discuss the refinancing on the 2006 bonds as well as if the board is interested in looking at the possibility of issuing any other bonds. Okay. Any questions for Tim on this? All right. Thank you, Tim. Let's go on to the principal's report. Oh, excuse I'm sorry. I have one question. Okay. Um, later on, I think Art's coming up here talking about uh, pay to participate. Um, I'm looking here, and there's a dollar amount that you have in here. You have, are you just be, uh, behind on the allocation of the registration fees and to move them up into the part of uh, play to participate? And have you reconciled his numbers to what you've collected? We probably are uh, behind in terms of transferring that money out of the registration fees into pay to participate, yes. Have but I have you up? reconciled his numbers to Not your at this numbers? point, no. Any other questions? If, if I could ask a question. Mm -hmm. Who was our underwriter before? William Blair. They were the underwriter and the advisor. Yes, at that time you didn't, you didn't, you didn't have, have to have, have a separate financial. Well, now is Blair out of the business of underwriting, or are they, they wouldn't? In? Yeah, they wouldn't be doing any underwriting on the bonds. But they'd they be advising us, us. For us, for yeah. Us. But no, they're not out of the I business. I assume they're all marketing himself as both, and if you yes. hire them for a bond, then they're not your underwriter, and if you hire them as an underwriter, they'll not your Correct. guy, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, thanks. Any other questions?